Good morning, everyone. It's Sunday, June 21st, 2020. We're here at Temple Hill United Church out in the middle of beautiful downtown Temple Hill. I must admit, this is my first time here, but it was easy to find. And uh, perhaps when you're out driving around one day, you'll, you'll come by and uh, check out this beautiful building. My name is uh, John Smith, Reverend John, and I have with me our normal cast and crew, but our singers today are Barbara and Jane, so we're grateful to have them come along. I think it's better than just hearing me sing faintly in the background, so uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have the two of them here with us today. It is Father's Day, so uh, congratulations to all of you who are fathers or considering fatherhood. And uh, for those of you celebrating today, I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, we were today supposed to be at the Rockland Car Show, also a place I've never been, and uh, I was really looking forward to that. So I'm hoping that at the end of our service today, someone will show up with a fancy antique car. Um, I'm just going to keep that in the back of my mind. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. Anyways, time for church, and uh, David is here to play our prelude. in the light of Christ. We uh, are, carry the light of Christ with us, and the light of Christ lights up this time together that we have today. And um, before we begin, I wanted to also mention these beautiful flowers here that are a gift from Carl and Jean uh, Benninger, and they are in a memory of their daughter, Christine Brecklemans. So thanks very much to the Benningers for those flowers. I should point out that this uh, building is actually full of flowers, uh, so it's quite a beautiful sanctuary for us to be in. Our first hymn this morning is in Voices United. It's number 296. Number 296, uh, This is God's Wondrous World. See 
Thank you. That is a beautiful hymn, and in my own childhood memory, I do believe it was the very first hymn I learned in Sunday school. And uh, although I think back then it was called This Is My Father's World, something like that. It's time for our prayer, so let's take a quiet moment and uh, quiet our hearts, and then I'll lead you in the prayer. Let us pray. We come to this time of worship on this first summer weekend with a sense that somehow everything is going to be made new. The day before us is new, and the people we live with are newly restored. The plans we have for the day are new. Our thoughts and prayers are new. And we, who yesterday were weary and sad, it's our turn to be made new. Thank you, God, for this most amazing day, for it is the first day of the rest of my life. Thank you for gifting me with the people in my life, the pets in my life, the joy in my life, the love in my life. May I take the time today to bless and consecrate each and every one. And in our prayers, let us place before us the names of those for whom we would pray for fathers today and for grandfathers too, for those new to fatherhood and all the fears of messing things up, for those who are grieving, for those who are lonely, for those experiencing these long days as much too long, for those who are finally able to connect with their families during this COVID time, for those engaged in the work of social justice, for those working to abolish racism, for those seeking reconciliation and peace with our Indigenous friends, for those on the front lines still facing unknown threats each day. This is your wondrous world, O oh God, and we know that you love it despite the flaws and the faults we so easily name. Help us to love it too. Help us to cherish it and, tre and treasure it. Help us to find the time to connect and to reconnect to all the energies of your creation that we might bless one another in these days. Just another moment of quiet. And now let's join our hearts and voices in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing two verses of Come and Find the Quiet Center. That's number 374 in the hymn book. Number 374.
So last week we talked a little bit about uh, setting time aside for Sabbath, and today I just want to show you uh, a very tangible uh, and easy way to have a little more Sabbath in your life, and I call it an altar in your home. And uh, so it's a very simple process, um, imagining or finding around your home um, items or pictures or things that represent the most important things in your life. In other words, the most sacred things. So the things that you hold sacred, then you place them out on a cloth. And uh, anywhere in your home, you could have a little table, you could have a corner of a table. I've done it with just a square of cloth. And uh, the idea is that it's in a place in your home where uh, you pass by every day. So you pass by this every day and you uh, have in front of you then a reminder of all the things that are sacred to you. And uh, um, the trick of it is uh, not to leave it set for a long period of time, but to uh, change it, to rearrange it, to add, subtract, uh, and uh, keep it fresh. So uh, now in one church where I did this before, I asked people to send a picture of their sacred altar that they'd made in their home. So if you would like to do that, uh, that would be great. You have my email address, or you can send it to uh, Patty at the church, and uh, I will be glad to collect those pictures. So just any old cloth, but this is one that... Uh, particularly find beautiful. And now just some things that are important to me. A vase that uh, reminds me of my father because it was made by the Rotary Club that he was uh, president and member of for um, eons. And that reminds me of him whenever I see it. I'm a collector of rocks and uh, people give me rocks all the time. And uh, so that's one that somebody gave me. I'm also a collector of shells. And uh, so I've collected shells from every beach I've ever walked. And uh, so this is uh, something really important to me. And the reason I, I like shells is because they uh, are eternal to me. I know they're not eternal. They have a lifespan. But to me, they, they represent things eternal. I have a page of music, and I have <clears throat> a picture of two of the important people in my life. And so you see, it's just very simple. I can walk by here and go, ah, yes, that's what's important to me in my life. It's a funny little story that St. Francis uh, told. Uh, he told many stories, actually, but a little uh, saying. He said, I once spoke to my friend, an old squirrel, about the sacraments. He got so excited, he ran into a hollow in his tree and came back holding some acorns, an owl feather, and a ribbon he had found. I just smiled and said, yes, dear, you do understand. Everything imparts God's grace. So may you be blessed by the altar that you make in your home. Our scripture today is going to be read by Muriel Lush. Muriel. It's great to be back in our building for a change. We are um, missing it quite a bit, and it's a big thing to miss. The scripture reading today is Moses Sees the Light, and it's from Exodus 3, verses 1 to 14, and the version I'm reading is from the contemporary English version. One day, Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and Moses decided to lead them across the desert to Sinai, the holy mountain. There, an angel of the Lord appeared to him from a burning bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not burning up. This is strange, he said to himself. I'll go over and see why that bush isn't burning up. 
When the Lord saw Moses coming near the bush, he called him by name, and Moses answered, Here I am. God replied, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. The ground where you are standing is holy. I am the God who was worshipped by your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses was afraid to look at God, and so he hid his face. The Lord said, I have seen how my people are suffering as slaves in Egypt, and I have heard them beg for my help because of the way they are being mistreated. I feel sorry for them, and I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians. I will bring my people out of Egypt into a country where there is good land, rich with milk and honey. My people have begged for my help And I have seen how cruel the Egyptians are to them. Now, go to the Pharaoh. I am sending you to lead my people out of his country. But Moses said, Who am I to go to the Pharaoh and lead your people out of Egypt? God replied, I will be with you. And you will know that I am the one who sent you. When you worship me on this mountain, after you have led my people out of Egypt. Moses answered, I will tell the people of Israel that the God their ancestors worshipped has sent me to God, said to Moses. I am the eternal God, so tell them that the Lord, whose name is I Am, has sent you. This is my name forever, and it is the name that people must use from now on. Thank you very much, Muriel. Well, I've been looking around at the world we live in, and I'm asking a pretty basic question. Do you think we can change it? I mean, you and I, we're the basic, uh, regular, ordinary Joes and Janes of the world. And do you think we really are going to be able to change this world? I mean, look around. Look at the racial tension south of the border and here in Canada as well, stirring up those long buried wells of our own racial blindness. Or the melting polar ice caps and the disappearance of species after species on almost a daily basis. Or Look at the calls these days to change how we do policing in the country. Or look at the deteriorating relationships between the countries of the world. This country mad at this country. This country, you know, uh, running roughshod over that country. And the shift in power away from the democratic countries of the world. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But if a virus can completely change the world, then maybe there's hope, right? A virus doesn't have any intention or any um, sense of good or, you know, any morality to it whatsoever. But, hmm, there's room, I think, for us. Change will come always, usually slowly through evolutionary means, It will also come more quickly if we employ revolutionary means. But for the vast majority of us, neither of those options appeals to us very much. Evolution takes too much time, and who has that much time? And revolutions are too messy and dangerous. I mean, let's face it, I'm not the kind of person who's going to go out carrying placards and marching in a protest. Is there another option? You know, for the scaredy cats among us, but who really do care, the scaredy cats among us who really do care, I think is kind of most of us. Is there a better way for our kids and our grandkids? And is there something that that we can model for them? Now, you know, in our time, many have documented that we live in a time of defragmentation and disintegration. Secularism and other forces have done an amazing job scorching the earth of everything religious. And now it's time for us to ask, should we, as the good church people of the world, be doing things differently? 
Because church people, like you and like me, we all need to be a part of the solution, not the problem. But what to do? So I have today just a few hints and guesses. Probably no such thing as definitive answers, but bear with me. A story from the ancient Celtic Celtic traditions, St. Kevin. St. Kevin was a praying monk, which meant his gift to the world was to pray for it and bless it. In the course of a day, he would pray for many hours, sometimes on his knees, sometimes lying prostrate on the floor, sometimes with hands in the air. Uh, And over the years, he became very good at being a praying monk. In the yard of the monastery, he had built a stick a stick hut, just big enough for him to to crouch in when he wanted to be outside and do his prayers out there. It was small, just for being quiet and peaceful on his own. But one day, he was sitting in his little stick hut, and he got the inspiration that, that he needed to stand up and pray. And so he stood up in his hut, kind of crouched over, and he stretched out his arms, and they went out through the sticks of the hut. And here we have this picture of this monk inside this uh, hut, standing there with both arms outstretched. And as he stood there in prayer, a blackbird came and sat on his hand. Now, St. Kevin was in the manner of St. Francis. He loved the birds. And so he let the birds stay there in his arm, in his hand. A few minutes later, its mate showed up and started building a nest in his hand. And so this went on for quite a few days until Mama Bird finally gave birth to the eggs that she was carrying. All the while, St. Kevin stood there in prayer, holding this bird. Can you imagine such a thing? But what is the one thing that you would hold in your hand for days in order to preserve it or save it and bring new life to the world? What is the one thing? Now, if you're watching this at home, this is the time to stop the the computer and answer the question with those you are sitting with. Ah, here we are back. When I was young, I took piano lessons and spent many hours practicing scales and arpeggios and such, that kind of stuff. It was very boring. Even today, though, I can close my eyes and play those scales and those arpeggios. I can even play them in my head. Over the years, I often wondered, what am I practicing for? I'm never going to be a famous pianist and play a Rachmaninoff concerto in Carnegie Hall. I mean, maybe David Fries would do that, but not me. I tried teaching. I didn't like it. I tried writing music a bit over the years, but I was never what you would call a prolific kind of artist. So why all the practice? Then I fell in love with W.C., that French impressionist composer who creates pictures in your mind, like moving art pieces that slip and sway with the wind. My favorite in in the genre was, or is called, Claire de Lune. I loved how the water under the moonlight uh, glistened and shimmered and rolled on as the piece goes through, as the piece is played. But it was a hard and demanding piece. Those chords used every single finger, and at the same time, they required the most delicate of touch. I would work at each chord separately, one by one, and master it note for note. And then I'd go on to the next chord, because they all changed, and then I would slowly be able to put the phrase together. It was a labor of love. I just so happen to have Claire de Lune. Let me show you. So it's not 
not just the notes on the page, it's the tone, it's the tempo, it's getting the rubato correct. There's a lot going on in this one little piece. I see now, of course, that I wasn't really practicing music. But what I was doing was I was learning to reverence the beauty of something. Reverence for things which are ephemeral and changing, which might disappear if not brought to light. Reverence for what I think happens in music, reverence for the underlying message of hope. Someone took the time to set those notes on paper that we might be uplifted. The same is true for scripture. Someone took the time to put those words on paper that we might be given hope. So I would say to myself now, all those years of practicing scales were maybe not quite as useless as I thought at the time because they led me to find my true vocation and I have now decided after I've retired what my true vocation really is. My true vocation is to love the world as much as God does. To love the world as much as God does. I wonder if that's an alternative to evolution and revolution. Because there's so much bad in the world's world these days, just read your newspaper or watch the news for half an hour, there's so much unrest and so much distress, I must keep practicing my vocation especially when it seems fruitless or impossible, especially when it seems there is nothing left to try, as it has been during these times, we must keep practicing the thing we love the most. It is the alternative to the way the world works. We make sacraments out of our loves, and then through the world, through our loves, we let new life come. Moses did not also know his vocation. Oh, he thought of himself as a sheep farmer, of course. He had done it for 40 years, tending the sheep in the Midian desert with his father-in-law Jethro. We all know that story. But this was not his true vocation. All those years with sheep were practice. Practice in the art of desert observation and flock preservation, which were the two skills he was going to need after he freed his people from the Pharaoh. Initially, this practice led him to a very deep place, to a a place of what we call a theophany or a revelation, that time when he was just hanging around in the desert looking for a sheep, uh, perhaps, and he caught sight of a bush that was burning but didn't get consumed by fire. He took off his shoes because he was told it was holy ground. Moses was getting a crash course in reverence. And then a voice from the bush gives him his true vocation. Go and free my people from Egypt. And as you know, I mean, we all know the ending of the story. All of that practicing paid off. I don't know if you've ever heard of Edgar Mitchell. In my mind, he is the most famous astronaut other than Chris Hadfield, I guess. Edgar Mitchell 
was the one who commandeered the Apollo 14 mission. Apollo 14 was the spaceship that went up into space after that ill-fated Apollo 13 mission. Imagine being the one to lead the next mission after Apollo 13. Even then, as difficult as it must have been to get on that next spacecraft, Mitchell was open to whatever might come. Certainly, he never dreamed it would change his life forever because he was the one who, on the way home from the moon, took pictures after pictures of the earth hovering in the sky. And one night, he found that he had kind of an out-of-body experience, a transcendent experience, that kind of experience where all the cells of his body dissolved into a sea of oneness with those billions and billions of other planets like ours and all those stars like flecks of light in the sky. He felt like all was part of one body. He understood that there's no separation between God and all of us that all are deeply one and that, in fact, every single living thing, including humans, have divine particles in it, as if we are fish swimming in a cosmic sea of stardust and light. I know it sounds fantastical, new agey, la-la land, goofy, but Edgar Mitchell was a scientist. And so the one thing that he would hold in his hand that he would reverence and which would become the defining characteristic of the rest of his life was the thought that we are material or that we are spiritual beings first and material beings second. That we are spiritual beings first and material beings second. I'm thinking about the world in which we live and I'm wondering if that's a different way of approaching things. Ralph Heinzman, in a book called Rediscovering Reverence, details what to him is the dominant pole position of our culture, which he calls the doctrine of self-assertion. The doctrine of self-assertion. What is that? Sounds like a lot of words on a Sunday morning. This is the notion that we are here as individuals pursuing goals, which are our own individual goals, dreaming of success, which is our own individual success, and striving for self-actualization, which essentially, if you're thinking about St. Kevin at all, would be like placing the most important thing in the arm of St. Kevin, and that would be yourself. That is the doctrine of self-assertion. And the problem is that if everyone is only out for number one, then the most important thing that we are holding has an impact on everything else. First, imagine teaching this to our children, that the most important thing is yourself. Second, we've learned that we can achieve anything we want regardless of the cost But the costs have been huge, as our dominant culture has been accused of subjugating other cultures. Black Lives Matter, Indigenous rights. These are the costs. Third, if the earth runs out of resources, what is that to me? As long as I've succeeded and as long as I have everything that I need and want, The power of the myth of self-assertion is so strong that when it comes to the environment, as just one example, we ignore the plain fact that our actions or inactions will have a detrimental effect on the very people we claim to love the most. Our kids and our grandkids. And still, ourself. Now, if I was a Sufi, which I am not, 
They dance a lot, and I'm not a very good dancer. In Sufi mysticism, there is a saying, a drop of water in the ocean, the ocean in every drop. What they mean by that is what uh, was detailed a long time ago in a Canadian novel by W.O. Mitchell called Who Has Seen the Wind? We probably all studied it in school. It's worth going back to and having a look at because there is a point in that novel where little Brian O'Connell, six years old at the time, sees a drop of water on a leaf, on a spirea leaf, And as he looks into that drop of water, he sees or begins to see the whole, right? W-H-O-L-E, the whole of creation. And looking in at that little drop of water, he begins to understand in his six-year-old mind that everything is held within the whole. Everything is connected. This kind of seeing takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of practice to see the whole in everything. Everyday practice, seeing with different eyes, reverencing the world with a different lens. Now, I'm actually not making that up. Did you know that there is, in science, a a scientific fact called the observer effect? The observer effect is that our observing of something or our uh, spending time paying attention to something actually changes it at the cellular and molecular level. So this is not some kind of la-la land spiritual exercise. This This is science. There's great hope when a whole group of people reverence some of the same things. There's so much power when a whole group of people, say a church, a church community reverencing a whole group of, uh, a whole um, set of things has an incredible power for change. I think part of the problem is for many of us in our church communities is this, we actually don't know what we hold. In our personal lives, do you think it is possible to see the goodness of every single person, regardless of race or creed? And if not, get practicing. Do you think it is possible to see God in a burning bush or in an osprey or even in a black fly? And if you don't, get practicing. Do you think it's possible to see the beauty in your own family, including that one person who drives you completely crazy? If not, keep practicing. Do you think we'll ever make a dent in racism or in systems which support the ongoing colonization and subjugation of one people by another? If not, keep practicing. Do you think it is possible that by practicing holding one sacred thing in our arms until our arms want to break off in pain that will make any difference at all in the world? If not, keep practicing. Here's the thing. When we practice holding what is sacred and hold it in reverence, and when we take time to pay attention to what we think is the most important and sacred thing in our lives. And if we do that in our personal lives, but also in our church life as a church community, and if we do the work of being fully present to this moment of attention and observation, we are living our aliveness, right? We are actually bringing our energy, all of our energy inside of us to life. And so another way of putting it is this, we become the burning bush. We are the burning bushes, alive with the fire of being here at this time in the life of the world, at this time in the life of the world, is there not a crying need for people who love the world? Teilhard de Chardin said, someday 
after mastering the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity. We shall harness for God the energies of love. And then for a second time in the history of the world, we will have discovered fire. We'll see the fire, we'll become the fire, we'll hold the fire, and we'll make the world new. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a hymn that is from the More Voices hymn book. And uh, the More Voices hymn book number is 135, if you have that at home. Uh, Called by Earth and Sky. Thanks so much for uh, worshiping with us this morning on this Father's Day, and thanks so much to the people of Temple Hill United Church for hosting us here today. It's been delightful to be here, and I hope we can come again soon. And so as we go from this place, may we be filled with the love and the light of Christ, and may the love and the light of Christ walk with us, walk beside us, 
Walk in front of us and behind us, below us and above us, so that all that we do and all that we say might be done in the light and the love of Christ. Amen. Thank you.